All right, we'll get started in just a couple more minutes. Again, for anyone that's just joining, my name is Victoria. I'm a park interpreter from Santa Clara County Parks, joined by Rachel, who's also a park interpreter. Do you want to say hi, Rachel? Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. And we're also joined by Linda Will, who's our park program coordinator for our region. Hi, so grateful that you're all here. Thanks for coming. Lots of people that are grateful for the rain. Yeah, it's really nice to have some, some moisture and some wet weather. Some people who just went hiking, awesome. Lots of people who are grateful for their pets. That's so great to hear. Thanks for sharing everyone. All right, so we will get started with our program. You should be seeing my, my shared screen right now. Um, if you're not seeing that, uh, Linda can probably help you out on the back end just with figuring out some logistics. So um, we will get started. All right. So for our program today, uh, we'll start off by uh, reading a story together. So the name of this book is Night Song by Ari Burke. And I have the book here. I know my virtual background will make it a little difficult to see. And if you've um, joined a virtual program with me before, oftentimes I've read the book right on screen, but I'm doing something a little different today. So hopefully the audio is better and the, uh, the visuals will be better. So I'm not gonna actually be reading it right here on screen. I have some pictures of the book, so you'll be able to see the uh, beautiful illustrations. So uh, we'll read this children's book together. And then after that, we will talk a little bit about um, bats, the different species of bats throughout the world, all the really cool adaptations. So this book is a really great introduction to bats. Um, so if you are joining in and you're thinking to yourself, we're starting off with a kid's book, why well, wanna learn all the cool things about bats? Just have a little bit of patience because we'll get to that right afterwards. Um, but to test out my poll feature before I start with reading the book, just so I can get a better idea of who exactly is joining today, I'm gonna launch an attendance poll. So um, just so I have an idea of you know, how old everyone is, how many people are tuning in, because that's one thing with webinars, we can't really actually see how many people are on a program with us. So you should have a poll on your screen. There are two questions. So uh, if you don't see the submit button, it means you have to scroll down. Um, if you're joining from a web browser, the poll likely won't show up. So don't worry about that. Um, we'll just wait for the poll to close. Uh, it'll still give us a, a snapshot if as many people as possible can answer this poll for us. I'm gonna give it a little bit longer, probably about 30 more seconds. We have almost everyone has answered about 74%. I won't share these results. These are just for me. So I have a better idea of how to hear my program today. So thanks again for filling out these, this poll for us. a couple more seconds. Thanks for being patient. All right, I'm going to end it in five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Awesome. All right, so we're going to get started by reading our book. Um, the title of the book is Night Song, and it's by Ari Burke, and it's illustrated by Lauren Long. The sun had set, and the shadows clinging to the walls of the cave began to wake and whisper. Cairo, little wing, the bat mother said to her child, tonight you must fly out into the world, and I will wait here for you. But the night is dark, mama, darker than the moth's dark eyes, darker even than the water before dawn, the little bat exclaimed, twitching his ears this way and that. I know, whispered his mother. And when it is dark outside, I cannot always see, Cairo admitted, stretching his wings. There are other ways to see, she told him, other ways to help you make your way in the world. How? Use your good sense. What is sense? The little bat asked. 
And so we can see our main character, Cairo. He's hanging upside down like we know a lot of bats do. Beautiful illustration. His mother folded him in her wings and whispered into his waiting ears, Sense is the song that you sing out into the world and the song that the world sings back to you. Sing and the world will answer. That is how you'll see. Now fly from our cave to the pond where we bats like best to eat. Have your breakfast, then fly home, but do not go farther than the pond, not unless your song is sure. And then she let him go. So he's falling out of his cave or his bat house, wherever he is, getting ready to go find his breakfast for the first time. Iroh fell into the cold air for an instant, then flapped and turned and flew out past the mouth of the cave and into the waiting night. So he's not seeing a lot all around him. It's very, very dark. At first, Iroh tried to peer his way through the dark. Long arms rose out in front of him, waving slowly, blocking his path. He could not see around them or over them. Cairo was frightened. So we see what looks like maybe a bunch of trees, but they are really dark and it looks kind of scary, almost like hands that are, are coming out of the darkness to grab him. So if I was little Cairo, I think I'd be scared too. He remembered his mother's bright words, use your good sense. Cairo began to sing, softly at first. So there we see Cairo singing. We'll learn a little bit later what exactly it is that he's doing with his song in order to be able to see better. Then more surely, his song flew ahead of him and soon he could hear something singing back. Tall trees called out to him, chanted the lengths of their long branches and the girths of their rough trunks. Gleefully, he flew through the woods past pines, over maples, and away. So now all of a sudden as he's singing out into the woods, those trees look a little less scary. We can see some of their branches, some of that like bright green color, uh, maybe a squirrel that's up in that top branch crawling along on the, on the bark. Flying higher now, Cairo saw something sliding through the sky towards him. So out went his song and where danger once threatened, now Cairo, saw only a flock of flying friends flying above him on their evening errands. So he saw a large group of Canada geese flying in their, their V formation, but at first he couldn't see what they were until he, he sang his song out. As he flew farther, Cairo heard strange sounds, lines of noise, a thousand voices buzzing from one end of the sky to the other. For just a moment, Cairo didn't know what to do or which way to go, but he followed his own song. In the sky behind him flowed a river of whispers, fading away. The pond was just ahead. So it looks like he came across some telephone wires. So maybe he heard all the voices that were being transmitted across those telephone wires. Um, and he was a little confused when he saw that, but he's gonna keep flying because he's, he knows that he's close to the pond. When Cairo came to the pond, singing still, he was very hungry. All the night creatures were there above the reeds, thousands of tiny, tasty, flying things, each one humming a different tune. For Cairo, each of their songs sounded like breakfast. So he's singing a little more surely. You can see that a lot more of that pond is illuminated. Looks like there's lots of bugs, maybe mosquitoes maybe some moths, all sorts of, uh, maybe wa water striders, who knows? It looks like a tasty buffet. Cairo ate well that night. When he was full, he stretched his wings again and thought about flying home, but he began to wonder just a little. What lay beyond the pond? What lay beyond his mother's words? So he's looking out into the distance. It looks like there's a ladybug on that a piece of maybe it's tule or a cattail. Um, and he wants to go a little further because he's curious what else is out there beyond the pond. So Cairo flew a little bit farther and the familiar fell away from him, out, out to the margins of the world. Then he was truly on his own. He flew fast towards a high dune each grain of sand calling out in a chorus as he passed. 
Cairo flapped up and over the top of the dune and out over the strand, singing louder than he ever sang before. Looks like a beautiful sunset. Maybe, maybe Cairo is a Santa Cruz bat, who knows? We flew out to the ocean. Out went his song over dark water, then again and again, each wave on the ocean rising up to greet him, each splash of sea foam becoming kin to him. The sky began to change, grow light, and cast long shadows over the shore. With the morning came memory, his mother's voice, her warm wings. Cairo knew it was his time to go home. Flying higher than he'd ever flown, Cairo began to sing, listening, listening. The music of the land rose up in all of its many textures, each tree, each cliff, each place he'd passed, until finally the song of home added its voice to the others. So now as he's flying around, he's so sure in his song that he's able to see the entire landscape around him. He's become a lot more uh, confident and comfortable. His cave called out from the blanketing shrubs and pillows of moss at its mouth, and Cairo followed that familiar sound back into the sheltering earth. There he is flying towards the entrance of his cave. You can kind of see it all the way down in the corner right here. That looks like maybe the entrance to the cave. His mother caught him all up in her wings and asked, was it very dark in the world, little wing? What did you see? Why, mama, Cairo said laughing, it was very, very dark. And I saw everything. And then he yawned and turned his head into the warmth of her body, letting the rising sun's quiet song carry him, lull him, and sing him to sleep. And that's the end of our story, the end. So I hope that you enjoyed our story today. The name of that book again, um, if you're wondering, it's Night Song. Oh, it's gonna disappear on me. Um, it's a great fun book. It has some beautiful illustrations. So uh, if you like it, definitely see if you can go out and get it. I think that it's a beautiful book and it teaches us a little bit about bats, which we're gonna talk about uh, during our program today. So for our program today, as you can tell, I'm not actually out at the park, um, but we'll be doing a virtual hike a little bit differently. I have um, some footage from when I went out to Calero County Park to hike, and I have some footage of the bats actually emerging um, at nighttime to feed. So that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. And on our hike, we're gonna uh, make a number of stops, and along the way, I'll share a little bit more about bats. Um, well, there'll be some time for participation where I'll ask you questions and you can um, share from experience. And uh, then we'll, the final part of our, our program today, we'll be watching the bats uh, emerge from the bat inn. So right behind me, this is our destination for our virtual hike. That's the Calero Bat Inn. If you're interested in visiting the Calero Bat Inn, know, and this is very important, that the park is only open from sunrise to sunset. So it's not possible for you to actually go and see these bats emerge at nighttime because the park is not open to the public. We had hoped uh, to offer this program uh, in person. We were gonna have a program where we drove people out to the Bat Inn because it is a long hike. Uh, it's about two miles to get up to the inn and uh, depending on which way you go, it can be very steep as you'll see in the video. So hiking up there and then hiking down in the dark uh, is definitely an adventure, but it, it can be a barrier to a lot of people. So hopefully you'll have fun on today's virtual program. Uh, so about a five mile hike, 600 feet of elevation gain, but a couple sections that are, are very steep over a, a very short section. So we will start our hike here from the McKean entrance of Calero County Park. And I will share that video and tell you a little bit about the trail as we go along. So we're gonna take the Oak Cove Trail. And one of the first things that we're gonna come across is this very small pond. I think it's called Los Cerritos Pond. And there, people like to fish there. I don't know that the fishing is very good, um, but I oftentimes see people at that pond fishing, so um, a nice place to go. And this is actually our first stop. And 
this stop, I want to start us off by asking you all to help me uh, define what a superhero is. So if you joined me for my woodpecker program, uh, you know that that program was also superhero focused. So you might have a little bit of a head start in terms of figuring out uh, the definition for a superhero. But I'm curious to hear how you all define superhero. So if you want to share in the chat with me what you uh, think the definition for super superhero is, and then together we'll discover how bats are superheroes. Um, hence the name of our program today, Bats Superheroes of the Night. So feel free to enter in the chat what you think for the definition of superhero. And I'm watching the chat to see if uh, what people are sharing. So I see some answers about um, having powers or wearing cool costumes, helping other people. That's a very important piece. So keep thinking about that. Um, and we'll revisit it in a second. We're not going to completely define it yet, but I love these answers that are coming in. So to start us off, we're going to talk a little bit about bat biology. So in our story, our main character, his name was Cairo. And so that's kind of an interesting name, right? Um, to me, it reminds me of Spyro the Dragon. It was a video game character when I was growing up. But the name Cairo actually comes from uh, the order that bats belong to, which is called Chiroptera. And so if you split that word up, it actually uh, describes bats very well. So the word Cairo means hand. And so if you think of chiropractors, that's a practice where you're using your hands a lot to manipulate the, the skeleton, the body. Um, so Cairo means hand. And then Petra means wing. So you can also think of like a or pterodactyl uh, is like a winged creature. So you put the two together, it means hand wing. And that is exactly how bats fly. Um, so Bats are not birds. They are, they're, they're different from birds. Um, they fly, um, but that's pretty much the most of what they share with birds. So bats are mammals, and that means that they are warm-blooded. They have fur. Um, we as, as mammals have hair on our heads, right? Um, mammals also give birth to live young. So uh, bats give birth to live young and they, the mother bats feed their newborns milk, just like humans and other, other mammals do. So bats are mammals, number one. And then their flight, like I mentioned with the hand wing, um, is different from birds because bat wings are, and I have something here, I know it's not as easy to see because I'm the little picture up top, but a bat wing is different from a bird wing because a bird wing is more of and that, and that, uh, it's more similar, similar to, to if you think about our arms. So if you want to, to do the chicken dance right now, that's similar to how bats fly uh, or bird, birds fly. Bats, their wings are more like our fingers. So this, the thumb is basically similar to this little piece of their wing that's right up here. And then they have all of their fingers, but imagine them way longer and then with skin in between. So by having all of those little joints and knuckles, bats are able to maneuver really fast. So they can have one wing maybe that's out uh, fully extended and then the other one, they can do all sorts of weird uh, contraptions which allows them to maneuver uh, very well. Um, they can get around things at a moment's notice. They can go from flying to hanging upside down, right? That's different. Than, than birds. So uh, they're able to, to use their hand wings to maneuver, to fly. Uh, most bats are nocturnal, so they're going to be flying at night. We'll talk in a little bit about how they're able to do this. And most hang upside down. So that's important too, because a lot of, most species don't hang upside down. So it means that there's lots of places for bats to roost, which means they can hide from predators when they need to sleep. Um, and they actually have a, a special adaptation that allows them to hang upside down. So if 
I was to try and hang upside down for a really long time, holding on that long would be super hard. It would take a lot of work. But the way that the bat's uh, legs are designed, there's a tendon where the, the resting position is actually clamped shut. So for a bat to hold on, the weight of their body pulls that tendon shut around that branch so that it doesn't take any work to hold on to the branch. And so when they're ready to fly away, all they have to do is open up their feet and drop down and they're able to fly. So um, bats are flying mammals and that's different from, um, if you were to think of like a gliding squirrel, they don't actually fly, they glide, they don't power their own flight. So bats are the only flighted mammal, truly flighted mammal. Um, and they're very diverse. They make up 20% of all mammals on the planet they're found on every continent except Antarctica, and they amount to over close to 1,400 species. So all over, very, very diverse. So we're gonna keep hiking, uh, and you'll see as we go along that we're gonna go down for a little bit, and then we're gonna go back up, and we're gonna keep going up. So there's an intersection that I didn't show, but uh, we're gonna stay straight instead of going to the right to the reservoir. And you can see from this video that I'm a very fast hiker up these steep hills. And as we look back, we've gained a decent amount of elevation already. And in the far background, you can start to see the parking lot. So that's where I just parked my car and we're gonna keep going up. So as we keep hiking, there's a couple sections where there's some shade, which is really good, especially when you're working hard climbing up all of those hills. And then we keep going up and we're gonna have some other great views. I'll turn around in a second and show you. So we're looking towards uh, Mount Hamilton is up there. And then up to the other way, you can see that bright green area. That is the Cinnabar Hills Golf Course. And then we'll come to another trail junction and we'll go straight. But first, I want to show you the view of what's down below. So we are now above the reservoir. So that's Calera Reservoir. The boat launch is down over there. And this is going to be our next stop. All right. So echolocation, this is a new word I haven't talked about yet. So in our book, Cairo, our main character, he uses what's called his good sense. And his mom describes sense as the song that you sing out into the world and the song that the world sings back to you. So that song that he's singing out into the world is what's called echolocation. And this is how bats are able to see at night. So the way that they do this is they sing out a series of high pitched squeaks that we can't hear them with our, with our ears, but these high pitched sounds travel out and when they hit an object, they bounce back to the bat. And so it keeps singing out and those sound waves will keep bouncing back to the bat and they tell them a bunch of information. So how fast that sound travels back to the bat tells distance. Um, it also can tell information about the size of the object. So not only are they using these uh, echoes to find their prey, to know when they're getting closer and closer and closer, but also to kind of map out the surrounding environment. So where is that tree? I don't want to hit that tree. Where is that fence post? I don't want to hit that. Where is, uh, you know, whatever else is out in the environment. So they're constantly singing out these high pitched little sounds that bounce back to them and tell them information. And so um, this helps them to see in the dark. Now, bats are not blind. If you've ever heard the saying, blind as a bat, um, that's not true. Bats have pretty good eyesight, um, but they're able to use their echolocation to improve how they're able to see in the dark. So they don't see necessarily like you and, and I see, uh, especially most bats that eat insects. They don't see color as well as us. There are some bats that see color very well, and I'll talk about them in a little bit but echolocation allows them to see in the dark in, in addition to their regular sight. Um, so you can see in the illustration that I have here, we have Cairo singing out and where he sings, he's able to see all these little insects similar to this bat down here that's singing out and then it, the sound waves bounce back to the bat to tell them information about 
where that moth is that it really wants to eat. So there are, are like I mentioned a little bit ago, there are tons of different types of bats all over the world and they eat different types of things. And a lot of that's based on where they live. The majority of bats, 70% uh, of the species that are on this planet eat insects and all of the species that live in the Bay Area, and we have 16 species that are documented to live in the Bay Area, eat insects. So that's all that our bats eat. We don't have any that eat the other things I'll talk about in a little bit. So they're eating insects, which is really important for us because um, it means less mosquitoes, right, that are gonna bite us when we're out hiking or eating food in our backyards. Um, and they can eat a lot of insects. So bats can eat 1,000 to 2,000 insects an hour, essentially their body weight in insects, uh, which amounts to a lot when you think about how many bats are actually are out there. Um, if you look at these pictures of bats, you'll see that they have uh, big ears, so that allows them to hear, um, to hear better. So as they're sending out uh, that sound, when it bounce, bounces back, they need to be able to hear to, see, to know what's going on. They have a short snout and that allows them to crunch down on these insects that have usually like a hard coat, if you think of like a beetle or something like that. Um, and then there's one species of bat that's really special here in the Bay Area and that's called the pallid bat. And this bat is um, able to eat scorpions and centipedes and it is not affected by their venom. So it has this super immunity, which is really, really cool. Um, the pallid bat is the one down in this corner over here. And I think they're super cute. I, this picture doesn't do it justice, but I think they look a lot like baby Yoda with their giant big ears. So uh, look up some pictures of pallid bats and let me know if you agree with me. Or you can let me know in the comments, uh, the chat, whether you think the, that any bats look like baby Yoda. Some bats eat frogs and fish. Yes, you heard me right, and lizards too. I don't have a picture of a bat eating a lizard, but some bats can eat lizards. None of the bats that we have do, but bats in Central and South America um, can. And so there's one species of bat that is actually able to tell poisonous frogs apart from uh, non-poisonous frogs. So it's able to do this by listening to the calls that those frogs send out. They have a, a, a mating call and depending on the species, it, it's like a different frequency. And so the bat can tell which species is which. And so it'll avoid the ones that are poisonous, which is pretty smart. Um, and then there are also some bats that have uh, special uh, salivary glands. So their spit is able to actually neutralize some of the toxins in these frogs. So uh, if they make the wrong, if they make a mistake, they don't have to worry too much because they're not gonna drop dead. So that's good. Uh, and then there are also some bats that eat fish. Again, these are bats in uh, Central and South America. Um, and they can't completely use echolocation to find the fish because echolocation isn't able to permeate the water. It's gonna bounce right off the water, right? But what they can do is use it to uh, look for ripples along the top of the water. So in areas where there are lots of fish that come to the surface very frequently, lots of little fish, they're looking for those ripples and they're ready to strike as soon as there's a fish that's coming up to the surface. And so they can reach in with their slightly longer legs and their big claws and grab those fish and bring them up. Pretty crazy. All right, some of my favorite bats, because I think that they're really, really cute. Um, we have our fruit and nectar bats. And so these bats have big eyes, um, which means that they have good vision. So uh, most of these bats uh, don't echolocate. So some do, some will use their good vision and echolocate. Some, uh, especially flying foxes, they do not echolocate. So they rely solely on their vision to find fruit. And they have really good eyesight. It's about 20 times better than our eyesight. And they can see really far distances at night. Um, some of these bats are not nocturnal, but most flying foxes are still nocturnal. There aren't very many species of bats that aren't nocturnal. Um, and then you have nectar bats, which have really long snouts as well. 
and those help them to get into flowers. So if you think of a hummingbird that's able to, with its really long beak and long tongue, get into a flower to, to suck up some of that nectar, there are bats that are ad adapted to do that as well. And so um, this is really great because when they're in there and those flowers getting the nectar, they get covered in pollen. And then when they go to fly to another flower to suck nectar, they're spreading pollen between lots of different flowers. And then for all of the bats that eat uh, fruit, uh, they're gonna spread those seeds either by spitting it out if they don't eat it or swallowing the seed and then pooping it out later. And because they're great flyers, they're flying long distances, they're spreading those seeds out, right? So um, some of my favorite bats, I think. And then also these bats can be very, very large. So um, the picture doesn't do it justice, but the largest uh, bat in the world is a flying fox, a species of flying fox. And its wingspan is close to six feet, which is, taller than me, I'm only five, six. So very, very, very big bat, mega bat is what they're called. So lots of fun. And then there are bats that drink blood. So this is what I think appears a lot in pop culture, especially in movies. We just got done with Halloween, right? So vampire bats, there are not a lot of them. Out of all the species of bats, right? I said there were over 1,400 species, there are only three species that uh, drink blood. And so one of these species drinks only bird blood, one will drink only mammal blood, but most of the time it's gonna drink something that you know isn't moving around a lot. So a lot of times it's cattle or livestock. And then there's another species that will drink bird blood sometimes and you know mammal blood sometimes. So sometimes it's bird, sometimes it's a cow. Um, but only three species. And all of these species are found in Central and South America. So we don't have them here. You don't need to worry about them. Um, but even if they were here, it's not, they're not drinking all of your blood, right? They're tiny little bats and they're only drinking enough to, to fill them up. So uh, what they do is they're actually really good climbers. They'll cl uh, walk along the ground and climb up onto say a cow and they have special sensors in that weird little nose of theirs that allows them to, it's, it's like heat vision, and it allows them to see where the, the most kind of blood is concentrated in that animal. So they know exactly where to use their little fangs to get in there and start lapping up the blood. And they have a special uh, protein in their saliva that allows them to just keep lapping it up because it doesn't uh, scab and turn into, uh, or doesn't clot really fast. So it just keeps flowing nice and gently until they're ready to go uh, and they've had their fill. And so vampire bats sounds a little scary, but uh, one thing that I want you to know about these guys is that they're actually really nice to each other. So they have this thing that they do and it's called reciprocal altruism. And basically what that means is in their colony, when they are done eating for the night, if they go back and they find out that one of their friends didn't get enough to eat or wasn't able to find a meal, what these bats will do is they will regurgitate blood into their friend so that their friend doesn't have to starve. Isn't that nice? I think it's nice. And it's important too, because um, the bats that share, when they are down on their luck, other bats are more likely to share with them. So it's a good lesson for all of us that we should always be nice people and share with others who don't have enough um, in case you know we're down on our luck and we need some help too. So we can learn some lessons from bats. All right. So we're gonna circle back to the idea of superpowers. So we touched on a couple of these. I'm seeing now that I forgot to mention one of them specifically, but I've touched on pretty much all of these so far. The super speed, and uh, this is something I should have talked about when I was talking about flight, but uh, there's a species of bat, and it's actually one that we have around here that has a pretty cool title, and that is the title of the fastest animal on the planet. And it depends on how you define that, right? Uh, maybe you've heard a, like cheetah or you've heard a uh, peregrine falcon, but bats and this species of bat, the Mexican free-tailed bat 
is the fastest flyer when it comes to uh, horizontal flight. So um, the Mexican free tail bat can fly up to 100 miles an hour, which is really fast. If you compare that to say the peregrine falcon, which is known to reach speeds of 240 miles an hour, but that's if it dives, that's if it goes from somewhere high up, tucks its wings in and then lets gravity kind of help it along. If a peregrine falcon was to try and fly uh, horizontally, you know, the fastest it could get was probably 60 miles an hour, but a, a Mexican free tail bat can fly at 100 speeds an hour. So depending on how you define the fastest uh, animal on the planet, the Mexican free tail bat can get that title, which is pretty cool. So we have flight, we have super appetite, being able to eat your body weight or more in whatever food you want. It's, you know, insects with bats or blood, but uh, for the purpose of this exercise, it could be anything. Super immunity, so you don't have to worry about venom or poison, heat vision, and then echolocation, which is con uh, a combination of super hearing and night vision. So I'm gonna launch a poll right now, and this poll will be for you to vote for your favorite superpower. So it is allowing multiple choice. So if you have multiple people tuning in, you can uh, each pick one. But if you're by yourself, just pick one, try and pick your favorite. And we will, uh, I'll share these results with everyone once I see how many people have voted. We're almost halfway through the voting. We'll see. I'll give it about 15 more seconds. We're almost to 75% and I'll share these results with everyone um, and I'll announce them too for anyone that may be tuning in from a web browser. We're at 82% right now. Give it about five more seconds. All right, I'm going to end the poll and I will share this result. So echolocation was our winner. Maybe I should have separated the two. Uh, people wanted two superpowers instead of one. So choosing echolocation works. Pretty cool. So 59% chose echolocation. Uh, we had 31% choosing speed. 13% choosing flight, 16% for both immunity and heat vision, and super appetite was uh, last place with 6%. So awesome. Thank you for participating in that poll. All right. So we are going to continue on our hike. I know people want to see the bats. So we will walk past this little forested section. There's an intersection that can sometimes be confusing where one goes to a dead end water tower. But if you go the right way, if you keep going straight, you'll see some beautiful views of Mount Amunam in the distance. That was what was up there. And we have to go down this hill again. So we've climbed up and now we have to go back down. But you can see Mount Amunam in the distance there. So, when we get to the bottom of the hill, there's what can be kind of a confusing intersection. The trailhead marker is kind of tucked underneath a tree. And so we're going to want to go to the right. But before we do, I'll pan to the right and show you where our trail is going to go off into the distance. We're going to finish our definition of superhero. So we've talked about superpowers. Um, and uh, the missing part of the definition of a superhero though, the hero component, right? Someone who is a superhero needs to do good for others. So someone who might have super, super power, super abilities. So all the things that we just mentioned about bats, but they have to do good, right? They can't use those powers for evil or they'd be a super villain. So bats are superheroes because they do many great things, not only for people, but for the environment. And we're gonna talk about 
all the things that are on this list, um, insect control, pollination, seed dispersal, fertilizer, and research. And I've touched on a couple of them already. Um, but before we do, we're gonna launch another poll because I wanna demonstrate for you that cats uh, are with us every day, whether we think they are or not. So for this poll, I want you to select any of the things that you may have eaten today, either for lunch or for breakfast, maybe a snack. And then I'll be able to show you uh, how bats have helped you out today. And I get to know what people are eating. <laughs> Lots of people eating fruit. Okay, cool. That's good. Lots of fruits and vegetables. I'm impressed. But also a lot of sugar and chocolate. I wonder if that's left over from Halloween. Awesome. Give it about 20 more seconds. Lots of fruit eaters. Awesome. All right, I'm going to end the poll in about five seconds. And I'll share those results with everyone. So looks like a lot of people eat fruit and vegetables, which is really great to see. We also have grains and some kind of seasoning as well. No one likes to eat bland food. Uh, sugar and chocolate fell a little bit away. Not a lot of coffee drinkers, but that's OK. Um, all right, awesome. So. If you submitted any answer in this poll, you can say thank you to a bat, right? You can have gratitude for a bat if you couldn't think of something earlier uh, for something that you're grateful for. So let's discover why together. So one of the ways, and this is probably the, kind of the biggest blanket statement of how bats can help people is that they protect our crops. Um, all sorts of fruits and vegetables, pretty much anything you can think of, there's a bat somewhere that's eating some kind of a harmful moth or a larva or something that's gonna attack that crop. So asparagus, beans, carrots, spinach, uh, tomatoes, corn. When it comes to fruits, we have lots of fruits, fruit eaters, citrus, uh, pumpkin, strawberries, blueberries, any kind of berry, uh, all sorts of fruits. Seasoning like garlic, basil, ginger, even things like honey, because bats will eat the insects whose larva sometimes will attack um, those hives. Uh, seeds and grains, so oats, rice, wheat, cotton, um, all sorts of different nuts, coffee. I drink a lot of coffee. So bats are eating the bugs that are going to hurt these crops. So if you were to total up all of the, the bugs that, that bats eat, they are saving a total of $23 billion for farmers uh, in both just reducing damage to crops, which means higher yields, more food to be sold, but also because the, it means the farmers have to use less pesticides. That's less money that they have to spend. That's also pollinate a lot of, of different foods. Um, so over 500 species of plants. So Bananas, avocados, mangoes, coconuts, guavas, cloves, vanilla, Brazil nuts, and agave. So if we have anyone that likes to drink margaritas, you have a bat to thank because all of these plants and many more are thanks to bats pollinating them. So sometimes these are plants that maybe only uh, flower at night. So bats are gonna be out at night. They're gonna be uh, in that plant, maybe getting after nectar and then they fly to other plants, drinking more nectar and spreading that pollen around. So thank you bats for all these delicious vegetable or fruits that I like to eat. We also have bats to thank for dispersing lots of seeds, which means propagating plants. So almonds and cashews, papaya, figs, allspice, jackfruit, chocolate, so cacao. Um, Bats are eating these things and then they're pooping out the seed or they're uh, spitting out the seed. And then what happens is it's gonna land with some bat poop, which is a great fertilizer, and then it's gonna grow and turn into a new plant. Um, and so when it comes to rainforests, actually 90% of these rainforests that grow back are thanks to bats and they're, they're pooping or spitting out of these seeds all over the place. The bat poop, like I mentioned, so guano, which is what bat poop is called, is a great fertilizer. 
Um, and it's especially great or needed to make peppercorn, which is something that we put a lot of pepper on our food with our salt, right? Um, bats also inspire scientists. So uh, vampire bats have helped uh, scientists to develop anticoagulants. So that's a type of medicine that is able to, uh, to prevent uh, clotting. So they looked at those vampire bats and they were able to say, we can make something similar to that protein that uh, stops the clotting. So they're able to do that. Drones and robots. If you want a drone to fly at night, how are you gonna have it navigate and not run into things, right? If you want Amazon Prime to drop something off at your house in the middle of the night, um, you're gonna need a drone that can navigate San Jose and not crash into things. So uh, all sorts of different ways that we can learn from bats. And then really quickly, I'm gonna go through this because I, I wanna make sure we have time to get to the bats. Pumpkin pie season's coming up. We have Thanksgiving. So one of the things that you could do is look at the ingredients for this pumpkin pie recipe and try and pick out really quick, what things do I have bats to thank for, uh, to say thank you for? And I've folded a couple of them here. We have flour, pumpkin, sugar, ginger, cloves, black pepper, all things that exist thanks to bats in some way. So when you're eating your pumpkin pie this Thanksgiving, if you eat pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving, remember to say thank you to bats. All right, I'm ready to get to the bat end, so let's keep going. This hike's taken a little bit longer than I thought. There's so many cool things to share about bats though, can't help it. So as we come along the, the corner, we're gonna start to get a little bit closer to the reservoir again. So as we turn to the right, we can see uh, the Calero Reservoir in the distance, which is really important because we know that the bat species here really like to eat insects. And so there's gonna be lots of insects down at the reservoir. So we'll keep hiking along super fast. And we're gonna turn and this is as close to the, the reservoir as we'll get. And that's called Cherry Cove. And that is where all the bats are gonna go as soon as they wake up and are ready to, to go eat. So we are basically at the bat in. As we turn to the right, you're gonna see this structure right behind me come into focus. There it is, there is our bat in. It doesn't look like much, but it's very, very tall. It's about 12 feet off the ground and about eight feet high, wide. Um, I'll show you the dimensions in a little bit and what it looks like inside. So there's our bat in, my little bitmoji person underneath for scale, just to give you a sense of how tall it is. And that's a big pile of bat poop underneath, that's some guano. So we're about to watch the bats, but I wanted to show you what it kind of looks like inside. So inside the bat in, there are a bunch of uh, kind of like boards, they're called baffles that create places for the bats to sleep. And all of these different um, little pieces of wood allow for there to be different temperatures inside that bat in. And it might not look that big, but that structure can hold up to 12,000 bats. The footage that I'm about to show you was from last October when I went out there with our natural resources and staff and our biologist, and um, we were counting the bats that came out. And so we counted over 2,000 bats. Mostly they were Mexican free-tailed bats, but there were also a large number of myotis bats. Um, and so this bat in exists to provide habitat to bats. Um, bats all over the world are losing habitat and people are starting to move into their habitat. So it's really important that we can provide them with a place where they'll, they'll be safe and kind of away from people. So we're gonna watch the show now. So hopefully you'll be able to hear, um, there will be some, some bat sounds. You'll kind of hear their clicking a little bit and then there'll be some bat calls that are in a frequency that we can hear. And then at the end, it'll go back to just the regular bat chatter. So I'll play this for you and should start to see the bats flying out. Oh, sorry about that.
All right, and that is the end of our bats emerging. So just a little taste of what it looks like when they come out of their inn. Um, I was filming vertically because I was out there primarily to count the bats, not to, to film them, but I'm grateful that I have that footage because I wasn't able to get out there today. So it gives you a taste of, of what it looks like when, when they come out. It lasted for a while. It lasted until it was so dark that we could barely see them. So really quickly, this is kind of what it looks like inside. So we have some Mexican free-tailed bats um, and then it's open at the bottom so all that guano can come out. And so I'm gonna stop sharing really quick because I wanted to show you what some actual bats look like. And so I have some specimens here and really quickly what I wanna say about specimens is that um, we have these for education purposes, but um, it's not okay for, for people to collect their own specimens and to have them. Um, handling bats is not a safe thing to do. And so um, we have these so that you can see what they look like up close and learn a little bit about them. So scientists can take measurements. That's generally why specimens are, are collected. So uh, this is to give you an idea of what they look like up close. So this is the California myotis and I'll try and hold it up so that you can see. So very small, obviously you can see in relation to my hand and they have those little ears. They look like um, mice. And so myotis actually means mouse eared. And so this is the California myotis. And then this is the Yuma myotis. And I know that the camera quality is not the best, but you can also see their tail has some webbing in between and they can actually use that to scoop up the insects. And then, um, let's see, I'll show you the hoary bat. So this bat looks a lot different. You can see it's a lot bigger and it has a lot of fur um, kind of on its back. It's a lot furry, furry, get more furry. It's very, very light. Still has big ears and a small face. So these hoary bats, these are not bats that would use the bat in. They are um, more of a solitary bat and they will roost alone in trees. Their fur allows them to kind of blend in and they tend to migrate long distances. They can migrate all the way from Canada down to Central and uh, South America. And these guys are different from most bats because they can have from one to four pups. So the myotis bats that I just showed you usually have one pup per year, but these bats oftentimes can have twins. So um, pretty neat. And then it's another kind of unique bat. So this is a red bat and you can look at that red fur color. Look at that cute little face. So these are also forest dwellers and they tend to uh, kind of roost alone similar to the hoary bat that I just showed you. And they also can have one to four pups. Um, and then sometimes they'll actually uh, roost in or like climb into leaf litter um, to stay warm in the winter and they kind of blend in. So you don't think of bats on the ground, but these guys can sometimes be found on the ground in forests. And then last but not least, I wanted to show you our uh, fastest animal on the plant planet. This is our Mexican free tail. And so how do you think it got its name? If you look at that little, oh gosh, sorry. <laughs> that little tail at the end right there. So similar in a lot of ways to that um, myotis that I showed you earlier, the California and the Yuma myotis. 
Um, these guys really love uh, moths. That's one of their favorite, favorite foods to eat. You can still see their kind of their little teeny teeth. So that helps them to crunch into those insects. And these guys are known to nest or to roost in very, very large numbers. So um, like by the millions in Texas, especially Bracken Cave, I think has 20 million Mexican free tails that, that fly out. Um, there's some bridges too that uh, where these guys tend to roost in very large numbers. So um, yeah, that little tail, pretty interesting. Crazy that this guy can get up to a hundred miles per hour. Um, all right. And then the, the Mexican free tails tend to be migratory as well. They can, uh, they'll go from kind of Northern California down to Southern California and to Baja, California. Um, but then in general, some of the bats that we have around here, they can stay year round because it doesn't get crazy cold. They might go into kind of like a state of hibernation into a torpor where their body gets down to a, a cooler temperature to conserve energy and they, their heart beats less times per minute uh, to save energy. But uh, we do have some bats that are here year round. Um, and then lastly, like what can you all do to help bats? Um, I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, so the number one thing is not to disturb the bats. So especially the bats that we have at Calero, just remember that, you know, we have that in for them to have a place that's away from people. So, you know, don't go beyond the fence. Don't go uh, out there and play a bunch of music. Let the bats be. Um, you can be a bat ambassador. So if you learned a lot today and you're a little less scared of bats, make sure you share that information with others so that, um, you know, bats have less of a bad reputation because they do so many great things for everyone there. They really are superheroes. Um, you can help to protect and improve habitat around you. So that means um, plants that you put in your own yard, things like evening primrose, things that maybe bloom at night that are gonna attract moths and things to pollinate. Bats are gonna eat those moths. So you can improve bat habitat in your own yard. Um, you can leave up maybe a dead snag or something that could potentially be good bat habitat. Um, not having a lot of lights on outside so that bats aren't exposed to predators if they're in the city. Um, you can reduce the amount of pesticides that you use. You can put up your own bat house. There are some bat houses that are better than others. So just make sure that you do your research before you put something up. And then you can be a citizen scientist. So that's what that picture is right here. Um, that is a little device that you can buy and plug into your iPhone that will tell you what bat it is that you're listening to. It can uh, hone in on those frequencies and identify those bats. So we are at the end of time. So I wanna thank everybody for joining today. Uh, I wanna respect the time, but we will have a little bit of time to answer questions if anyone wants to stick around. Um, be sure to check out our website, parkhere.org, for any upcoming programs. Um, we have a bunch that are you're still able to sign up for. Uh, so again, thank you everyone for joining today. I know we ran out of time at the end, but I appreciate everyone coming out and listening. So with that, uh, we can switch to question and answer. I will, yeah. All right, thank you so much, Victoria. So we have some great questions so far. Um, the first one is from Elsa and Alice, and they want to know, why do bat colonies divide by gender? Hmm. That's a great question. I know, so the, our bat inn um, has a maternity colony. So uh, that's female bats. So the mouse-eared bats, the uh, California myotis and the Yuma myotis. And I think even Brazilian free tails will split into maternity colonies and it allows them to have a, a safe place for them to rear their, their young together. Um, similar to, you know, when, uh, like other big colonies of animals, it, when you nest in a big colony, uh, others can help you by providing protection and warmth. Um, I don't think that they, they help take care of another bat's offspring. So I, I don't know for sure how that started, why they started to split off and, and not have males help them. But uh, if you look at their, their mating system, bats are not monogamous. Uh, they don't have one mate for life. So 
the fact that they split off into these male and female groups, I think makes sense because they're not bonded with their partner, but I don't know for sure why, why it, it happens in so many bats. That's my best guess. Thank you. All right, our next question is from Jana. Um, I believe they're asking if the scientific name of bats is Latin. Um, I don't know for sure if it's Latin or Greek, but I will have to look that up to clarify. I don't want to give the wrong answer. It might be a combination of both. Like, yeah, I don't know for sure. Sorry. No problem. Get back to that one. All right. Laura is asking, do bats have large heart to body ratios because they need to pump blood harder so that it doesn't all rush to its head? That's a great question. I don't know for sure the, the ratio of their heart to their body, but I do know that they have some adaptations that help with that. Uh, one is that if you think about their, their body size, their mass, um, they don't have a lot of, uh, of blood in general. So gravity isn't gonna play as big a role in terms of uh, their blood rushing to their head as it would with us if we were to hang upside down. But they also have special valves in their body that I think helps with the the circulation and the direction of blood flow. But I don't know for sure the size of their, their heart in relation to their body. That's something I'll have to look up. That's interesting. Thank you. That's an interesting question. Okay, next is from Ivy. Do the bats in the Bay Area have the white nose fungus? So I don't think that the ones in the Bay Area do. I know that it was detected, I think, up near Lassen Volcanic National Park. And it's something that we, that biologists are constantly just trying to monitor to make sure that it doesn't happen in our bat species. Um, it does tend to affect myotis bat species, which is the one that we have at Calero. So it would be pretty bad if it made its way there. Um, it's a fungus that affects bats that tend to go into hibernation, right? So one of the benefits of being in California is that not all of our bats need to hibernate to the same degree as maybe say bats on the, the East Coast or somewhere where it gets really cold. Um, so the fungus is something that uh, makes the bat wake up while it's hibernating and then fly out into the cold to waste energy. And so um, I don't think that it's here in the Bay Area, but it is something that I think scientists are trying to, to prevent and be aware of. Um, and that scientists are always trying to find answers to. There was recently a, a competition uh, that was hosted by US Fish and Wildlife Surf Service to uh, encourage innovation in terms of developing a solution for white nose fungus. And one of the winners was actually uh, a combination of Oregon State and uh, University of California uh, graduate students and their idea was to create an aerosol spray that will genetically silence the fungus. Um, so they're not there yet. They don't have the spray ready to go in and like, you know, dispatch to areas where the fungus is affected, but it is a really realistic solution that they're able to fund a little bit and look more into. So hopefully something comes of that. Um, yeah, and hopefully the fungus doesn't affect any more bat species here, especially locally. Yes. All right, thank you. So a question that's coming up a lot is what are the major bat predators? Ooh, that's a great question. So uh, birds of prey, hawks, um, owls. So if you think about bats being out at night, so owls definitely can be a main predator. Uh, that's a really important thing when it comes to bat house design um, is to make sure that there isn't a, a perch or something where a raptor or an owl can uh, easily get in and just eat the bats up. Um, raccoons, uh, what other, coyotes can eat bats. Uh, I'm sure a cat would go after a bat as well, um, but for sure, sure raptors and uh, owls are some of the, the major bat predators. All right, so I'm gonna combine these two questions um, from Corey and Kat. Corey's asking, what inspired you to like bats? And Kat wants to know why a lot of movies are inspired by bats turning into people. Hmm, that's an interesting question. Uh, so what inspired me to like bats? Um, I like things that fly. So I'm more of a bird person actually, but 
Um, I like really anything that can fly and bats are, you know, they fly, they fall under that category and there's just such a diversity of them and they're found in so many different places and they, they eat so many different things and they, they look really cool. Um, also being able to actually witness bats emerging from a cave in large numbers or the, the bat in is a really special experience. And it's something that I hope that um, anyone that's here today will have a chance to experience in the future because if you see it with your own eyes, it's just such a magnificent sight that it really, it'll inspire anyone to, to like bats and to wonder a little bit more about them. And then in terms of movies about bats turning into people, I'm not really sure how that that came about. I'm just, like, I bet there's some interesting uh, pop culture or like uh, folklore and how that developed that I'm not aware of, but um, to, that has to do with vampires. But I think I did read that uh, vampires, the idea of vampires that existed before uh, vampire bats were ever discovered. And so I think they had, uh, vampires turning into bats before they had actually found bats that drink blood. So that's just kind of a weird coincidence that developed. I don't know. All right. So it's like we have one more question from Kat. Uh, they're interested in putting up a bat house. Um, they're wondering, do they have to be up on a pole or can they be mounted on the side of a building? Yeah, so I'm going to share my screen really quick. You should be seeing this resource page. So I think the general recommendation is to have a, a bat house that's up on a pole that tends to provide more protection from predators than something that's on a house. Um, one of the best places that you can go to look up the bat house designs is uh, Merlin Tuttle's website. He's a, a world renowned bat biologist. And so he has some really great bat house uh, designs and recommendations on his website that you can download or, or adapt uh, to be similar to your own. So he's the best resource on that. So um, I, I think it kind of also depends on what your, your property in your house looks like and whether there's trees around or things like that. So uh, definitely do some research on Merlin Tuttle's website. Uh, bat Conservation International also has some information about bat houses as well. Um, so I'll leave those up just in case anyone else wants to visit. Okay. Awesome. So the, those are all, go ahead. The answer to what language is, is a uh, chiropter is Greek. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So those are all the questions we have. They're great questions. Yeah, I love how people are thinking very deeply about bats. There's always something new that pops into my head. Like today when it was raining, one of the first things that I looked up was, do bats fly in the rain? And the answer is they can, but they don't necessarily like to because it's really, really hard work and their echolocation does not work as well. So yeah, I wouldn't want to get my fur all wet either. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, uh, Anyone that's still here, when this program ends, you will see a uh, survey um, that'll pop up. And if you have time to fill that out really quickly, it'll be great for us in terms of future programs, knowing how best to improve them, um, who attended today. So feel free to fill that out. If you don't have time to fill it out right after this program, I will share a, a link to another survey as well. You can fill out whenever you want to. Um, so thanks again for uh, joining us today. And yeah, I will end this program. If you have any questions about the, the hike at Calero, feel free to message me. I'd be happy to share this highlighted map so that you can go out there during daylight hours to see the, the bat in and the big pile of poop. <laughs> All right, uh, bye everybody. Have a great day, enjoy the rain. Bye. Bye everybody.